Okay, so we can get started. So hello, everyone. I hope you guys are all doing well today. So I would like to welcome Heidi and Joe Hatika. I hope I didn't mispronounce uh, that too badly. Uh, from the Fizzy Lab Foundation, and they're here to present their talk titled Rebooting K-12 through STEM Education Amid This Pandemic. So um, thank you guys for coming out. And uh, I would like to give you the time to uh, talk about uh, your presentation. Thank you everyone for joining us. So we're, I'm going to start off by introducing myself. I'm Heidi. I'm currently 15 and I started my entrepreneurial journey when I was four years old by creating clothes for my American Girl dolls and then selling it to my friends. <laughs> and I'm uh, Joe Hudica along with our daughter Heidi and our son Joey. Uh, my wife and I founded Fizzy Labs Foundation based on watching what Joey and Heidi did over the years with their creativity and pivoting it into the world of STEM education um, in some pretty cool, exciting ways with the partnerships that, that Heidi's going to share um, with you in a little bit. Yeah, so today we're going to talk to you about um, an air quality sensor kit that we developed. Um, and our company started as Fizzy Labs, but over time it has developed into MyMars Mission. So MyMars Mission uses this air quality sensor kit that measures temperature, humidity, and CO2. This kit allows students to learn how to like solder, code, and collect data, and even work with NASA scientists. But um, obviously we didn't meet NASA in a day, and it's kind of crazy to look back and think how a 10-year-old and a 15-year-old actually met NASA. So first I wanna go back in time to the beginning of Fizzy Labs with our two games. So I have them here. The first one that we developed is called Launch, and it's made all in New, New Jersey. Um, and it's a game that helps students learn like um, business terms and how, how to actually go through the process of developing a business. But the game I'm gonna talk more about today is called Out of This World. And this game was made all in the United States. It also won the 2018 National Parenting Product Award. So I have it here, I'm just opening it up and then I'll show everything when I get it out. So we have like the pieces, we have money and of course it's in billions because this game occurs in space, so obviously. <laughs> and then all of our pawns are rockets that we made by 3D printing and these are actually used like molds. So. Timer, more pawns, I'll get everything out here. And I'll let my dad commentate and add anything he wants to <laughs> while I take everything out. So about six years ago, Joey and I had their very first community learning event. It was a family uh, fun night at the YMCA, and we named it the launch party because it was based on that first game. Someone in that room um, came up afterwards and said to Joey and Heidi, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty fascinating that you somehow incorporated the concepts of, of space travel in this, um, you know, in entrepreneurial learning game. Do you happen to know anybody at NASA? Well, within about 48 hours, next thing we knew, we were road tripping down to Goddard Space Flight Center. And that game that Heidi's about to walk you guys through uh, out of this world, literally pivoted in its, in its design and experience on the ride back on Interstate 95 northbound from Maryland back up to uh, New Jersey that day. Um, and really what's so fascinating about it is the, is the way that it, it treats creativity as a uh, as a muscle, if you will. It, it is something that there's plenty of studies that prove as we age, we, we lose access to creativity. Um, what this game has actually helped us discover, and we're, we're working towards a, a longitudinal study on this, is that creativity serves more like a muscle and it can be reinvigorated, retrained and, and strengthened again. Um, so, so Heidi's going to take us through a quick little scenario of this. I think we're gonna need a couple of volunteers. What do you think, Heidi? Yeah, and don't worry, we can all still work together, so you won't be by yourself. 
Is there any immediate volunteers? It's not hard, I promise. Okay, great. I can volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> so first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick three tiles for you. And these tiles you have to use in creating a product or service. Let's see the ones you get. Okay, so you got case, then you got tip, and then chest. So these words have two different meanings, so you can use either or. And you have to create a product or service that uses this, and it has to help one of something that you roll on this die, and then the location is on this one. So I'll roll it for you. Okay, so you got plants in the air. So your final idea has to help plants in the air, and you have to use chest, tip, and case. Now, one more catch. You have to do this in 90 seconds, <laughs> but we can all work together, like I said. So I'll just flip over the timer right now. If you need me to hold up any of the things, I can say them again. So go. Okay. So you said tip, case, and pencil, or what was it? It's Chair. tip, case, and chest. A oh, chest, sorry. Chest, and it has to help plants in the air. Yes. Plants in the air. Um, okay, so maybe, okay, so maybe it could be a sort of chest or like a case around plants to prevent bugs in the air from eating it or something like that, maybe. Um, and then, so how could we incorporate tip? Um, let's see. Um, I don't know. Do you have any ideas how we can maybe incorporate the last how about one an anti, how about a gyroscopic anti-tipping mechanism okay to make sure <laughs> yeah maybe maybe a little a tipping mechanism to prevent if there's like squirrels or something so then it tips and then they can't they can't eat the plants so maybe this something to protect plant uh plants from birds squirrels and flying insects uh yeah something like that maybe the case the chest. Uh, I guess I kind of use case and chest like interchangeably. Um, uh, <laughs> you could like store, maybe there's something to store like bird food in it also. So there's like a case for bird food, uh, something like that. So maybe like a little outdoor garden plant protector uh, thingy, I guess. That's my best, my best shot. All right, well, congratulations. In 90 seconds, you were able to get to something that helped the plants in the air at those three criteria. What happens next, Heidi? <laughs> now you have an another 90 seconds, and you have to actually pitch this idea to all of us. And with our billions of dollars, we get to choose how much you want to invest in your idea. <laughs> so you got to brand it, not just pitch it, but then you got to brand it, right? Because yeah. it's got to have something that we're going <laughs> to attach to emotionally uh, while you're pitching it and pricing it. Okay. Um, all right. So maybe we could call it the plant protector. And okay. So obviously you guys all either like gardens or know people that I guess like to garden. Like my mom loves to garden. Um, and of course, I guess one big issue is you don't want animals or insects eating your mom's plants. So of course, that's when you can rely on the plant protector, which is essentially this all-in-one guarding device that you could put around precious plants that protects it from squirrels or harmful insects or maybe birds or a, and also has a, uh, a case that has bird food in it so that you could also use as a bird feeder. Um, there's also a tipping mechanism to prevent tiny rodents from eating the plants. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, I guess that's my, my cell. For it. For and the it. price? Only in five billion dollar increments. It's a pretty yeah. serious currency. Oh, okay. Um, well, I don't know how, how much five billion is worth, but <laughs> I guess we could say 1999 billion, something like that, maybe. <laughs> so we'll, we'll go 20 since they're only in five five billion dollar strips. Okay, all right. Yeah, so cool. we've got 20 billion dollars. Who's in? Anybody? If you're if you if you don't want to chat out loud, you can post it in the in the message line. Who would be in? Who's gonna who's gonna invest and support Matt's invention here? For the good of our gardens. 
Come on. I'm in. Who else is in? I'll, I'll invest, but I won't do the whole 20 billion. I'm going to give you uh, 10 billion. Okay. Shrewd. <laughs> okay. I'll still take that. <laughs> You know, thank you for participating, Matt. I got to tell you, it's fascinating whenever we get to do live events with this, with this game, um, regardless of the audience. There's a, there was a longitudinal study that Dr. George Land conducted with NASA many, many moons ago. Um, and its intent was to help discover a sort of, uh, you know, fast track to identifying the most creative engineers um, as potential, you know, hires. Uh, the fundamental flaw with that, of course, is inherently, um, as we uh, educate throughout our, our lives, we start moving more to structured regimen and further away from creativity, right? We toss the crayon somewhere around seven years old max um, and a lot of the creativity with it. So what was really curious about that study, and I don't know if anybody's familiar with it here, um, but... It, it was a longitudinal analysis that, that looked at the power of creativity in, in kids five years old. And anybody, give us a guess at, uh, on a basis of 100% of their creativity at five years old, how much access to their creativity did, did the kids exhibit? Give us a number. Veronica, you're in. I see you're 100. in. 100. I say a five-year-old has all of it. <laughs> it was very, very close. It was 98%. So you're, you're right there in the wheelhouse. Now, how about when they were about 11 years old, the next time that they were studied? Where do you think their creativity was at? Chuck says 75. All right, 75, 50. I'm afraid we got to go lower. <laughs> <laughs> creativity was down already to about 32 percent at about 11 years old so let's go to about 16 17 years old this is right where they're formulating their 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 vision of their of their adult future where they're headed they're understanding what they want to educate and excel in what is the access to their creativity at this most pivotal moment in their life come on give me a number hint hint it's below 32 <laughs> 10 yeah, you yes. brought, almost, almost on the money, 11%. And by the time these students, these, these uh, now adults, 31, nine years-ish into their professional careers uh, were studied that last time, where was their creativity? Four. Is it four? There it is, Matt. Ding, ding, ding. It was the other end of the 98% originally, seriously. So, you know, so how does that happen? Well, there's a lot of reasons for it, right? Um, Fizzy Lab set out to figure out how we could focus on infusing innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship in the STEM education for this very purpose. Because if we can help people unlock their big why and the things they're interested in, in you know, the impacts they're looking to make in the world, it naturally leads them to have an interest and desire in learning about the skill sets and capabilities they need or need around them in order to be able to see that big impact that they want to make happen. And that's why we want to invite you guys on that little journey out of this world today, because it's, it's so powerful as we do it with, um, you know, groups of teachers, groups of professionals, and groups of students of all ages for this very purpose. Um, literally, it's that kind of thinking that got us on the cusp of the pandemic, just as Fizzy Labs Foundation earned its IRS 501c3 registration, we immediately had to pivot because now all of a sudden you can't see each other face to face, right? And we didn't know how long that was going to be. And lo and behold, the air quality um, sensor experience, you know, came to us through uh, one of our one of our relationships um, based in Germany um, with their with their little makerspace. And you know, we put two and two together and realized, you know, there is a tremendous educational opportunity here. Um, but at that time, we didn't even understand exactly how big it can be. Um, Heidi, would you like to go into that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So during the pandemic, like my dad said, we had to completely reinvent everything that we made while still remembering our core values of collaboration, communication, innovation. And so that's when we developed My Mars Mission. So My Mars Mission focuses around an air quality sensor kit. Like I said earlier, it measures CO2, humidity, and temperature. The kit arrives in parts, so I have one here. We just had the pilot with um, 
innovation like an in innovation laboratory. So have one of them handy. Um, the kit comes in parts, so I have the lights and the res resistors and the diodes in this bag. Then it also comes with the Wi-Fi board, the parts to cash. We also have the main board and the actual CO2 sensor. And then the last thing in the kit box is the case to protect the sensor itself when we build it. Then after you get all the parts together and you lay them out, students will learn how to solder following our video series which I'll show later on too. And you'll end up with a working sensor like this one. And then once you have the actual sensor, you need to upload code. And what we found when we started like testing this was a lot of people get scared when they hear coding and they don't really know how to do anything like the actual commands and how to make these parts measure data. And so now I want my dad to share a screen of the what we developed. Yeah, and for the record, I personally was terrified on the hardware side. <laughs> I, I've, lived, I've lived in the software world my entire career, so, so that wasn't a problem. Let's see if I could get this device. So on here, I know it's fading in and out, but you can see the device has a, has a Wi-Fi card on it, okay? Um, let me, there you go. So the card is communicating and sending out the beacon with an IP address, which any standard browser can get to. You just have to go to the Wi-Fi hotspot. The, the emoji is dynamic. So it's getting painted based upon the CO2 reading that the device is calculating. And along with it, it's also ca uh, capturing temperature and humidity. So you're getting three different factors of, of record all at the same time scale. And that information is not only stored locally on the device, but they can all be downloaded directly to CSV files. And one of the next things that we're working on collaboratively um, with the NASA GLOBE program, and let me just pause there a moment. Anybody familiar with or participating in the NASA GLOBE program? Okay, so, so NASA GLOBE is, a, is an, a brilliant program. It's been around probably a little more than 20 years now at this point. It is a... Um, it kind of began as a, with a focus of citizen science and, you know, has tremendous resources for various protocols um, for students, teachers, and, and independent research. The real power of it is the fact that it is already scaled to at the State Department level um, across 126 countries worldwide participating in this, harvesting data, providing it into a centralized repository within NASA GLOBE program, that the scientists get to, to leverage. And so this particular um, pilot project that we've worked through here with this air quality sensor is very exciting for a couple of reasons. You know, one of those, of course, is it can, it can help at scale, um, you know, many more students become engaged in the data collection and feed that into um, the researchers at NASA through the NASA GLOBE program. Um, but another more fascinating element that um, none of us anticipated, and really it became relevant because of the pivot into the pandemic. Um, it turns out that the GLOBE program does not presently have uh, protocols for indoor air quality, which struck us as kind of interesting. You know, on its surface, okay, there's a lot more air outside the buildings than inside, right? Um, and maybe that was the right place to focus before, but in a pandemic, when we're needing to be sensitive about what exactly the, you know, the conditions are in the indoor environments that we were in, in the classrooms, et cetera, um, you know, it became all the more important to be able to have the ability to capture and harvest that data um, and be able to study it and be able to learn from it. And you know, the intent there is to be able to do this going forward and, and help classrooms be able to do this on, a, on just an ongoing sort of standard basis. After all, indoor air quality is probably important in the space station and any other piece of equipment that our, that our travelers will embark upon, right? So um, we're really excited to see that we're gonna be helping, um, hopefully, establish some, you know, some study protocol in, uh, in the space of indoor air quality as well. Heidi? Yeah, and also this kit operates indoors and outdoors and all around the world. So one of my favorite things to do is compare the data with like friends in Germany and also right here in our house, different rooms. So I'll show you my current reading. 
it's not looking too good. Maybe I'm talking too much. Um, I have a frowny face and the light on my kit is bright red. <laughs> I, I've currently got a green light. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I tested it earlier and actually I competed with, with Heidi because my, my reading is at 686 now, which is a little higher than what is considered standard um, acceptable indoor air quality. Um, Heidi, what was your number again? Um, I think it was 900 at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we just had a presentation recently and, and the room had how many people when you did that one? This was think, in person. Yeah, I think it was around like 50, they said. Yeah, and the color immediately went red as the as the room populated <laughs> it. And just having a visual indicator of what the air quality is around you certainly strikes a different tone of uh, awareness yeah. with everybody that's uh, that's engaged in it. Let's me know that I definitely need to open a window right now or soon. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a window and a door to get a cross yeah, path. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Um, can you share your screen with the Arduino? Absolutely. So I'm going to get to the right window here. Hang on. Okay, can you guys see this very colorful screen? Okay, um, so our partners in, in, um, in Germany um, ha had created their makerspace, right? IoT squared Werkstatt. Um, and, you know, this is a collaboration with the university there, just like a lot of what Fizzy does is with many universities based over here in the U.S. Um, so a, a uh, professor had put together this modular programming environment. Um, this is what we utilize as we embark upon the, the training experiences, both for the teachers and then in turn for the students. You can see it's highly module. You've got color-coded um, objects to drag in, blocks to drag in from the left-hand side, okay? And they stack and plug into each other and they're all parameterized. So you've got the ability to basically set up a, uh, a linear flow, be able to have looping, conditional analysis. This is how we, you know, for example, can define the ranges within the CO2 uh, data capture to determine which light we should light up, for example, right? Um, there's so many other pathways to learn through this experience. We, we've certainly seen workshops um, where, where students notice that their fellow classmates are still using the same default password and they you know, try and jump in on, on their device and they start learning about things like cybersecurity. So there's so many different learning pathways to, to go down from, from having the starting point of learning to code in a modular way. Now, by clicking the upload to Octopus button here, um, that's the name of the board, by the way, by, by doing that, you'll see that all of the C++ code is generated from this, okay? So inevitably the students can then go from this visual experience to literally the code that, um, that this produces. And over time, after getting comfortable with the code itself can learn how to make modifications and, and additions to it. Um, this, is, uh, this is a current set of, of blocks that we have defined. There's several others that, um, that we're working on um, within the garage and, and will be released. One of the items that I'm particularly excited about, and again, this is just the, the nature of, of my background being in enterprise information systems, um, is that we're, we're aiming to have a set of APIs whereby the devices could communicate the data directly to the NASA Globe repository. Um, anybody who's ever dealt with data quality problems before will know exactly why that part excites me so much. You eliminate the risk of, of data transposition and quality errors when you take our hands off the data and the data files and, and allow the device to communicate the data directly to the, to the database itself um, and have a permanent system of, of record there. So, you know, this programming environment makes it so much easier for us to be able to collaborate with, with um, you know, educators of all different backgrounds. Um, you know, we, we, can, we, can have, we can have educators in, in the arts entertainment space kind of thing, as well as within all the traditional science, technology, engineering, math, right? The disciplines are, um, 
you know, allow us to bring a different level of creative participants in because there's not only the hardware to be done and then the software, but then the ability to design custom cases around it um, and bring in, again, students with various interests all together and see where they would, you know, like to go next with the, with the experience. So while the My Mars Mission Kit starts with this air quality sensor capability, it's very extensible and there's, there's several projects that are um, under design and underway uh, to build off of it. Heidi? Yeah, one of my favorite things is to see when, when teachers first get this kit, they have so many different ideas about like different cases, what they're gonna do, um, maybe like new sensors. And it's just so cool to see like all of their different ideas as we expand this kit further. One of the th things we've also added based on like suggestions we've heard is a toolkit. So schools and like teachers can rent out a toolkit where they get um, a solder iron and basically all the components they need to make this kit come to life and actually use it. Um, I also want to share my screen really quickly. Oh, I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Okay, oops, um, there you go. Can you see it now? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, another way that we've made our product and my Mars mission so easy to understand and follow is a digital way to go through the curriculum and see how I make, make the kit while you're making the kit. So I'm gonna put this link later in the chat. This is our main website. And after you sign up and register, you just have to fill out a couple things. Then you get to the welcome page. I'm gonna play the first video for you. Congratulations. You've been granted exclusive access to join us on My Mars Mission, a virtual journey in the PhysiLab's Innovation Accelerator, your professional fast pass to your bigger future. You are about to embark on a virtual journey with us into the PhysiLab's Innovation Accelerator. Your journey will guide you through a four-step virtual learning experience where you will connect with your mission, learning valuable skills and resources to help you reach the stars, not just reach for them. Along the way, you will unlock special access to Rocket Booster bonus content, which exemplifies how you too can completely transform the way you apply your creativity to your very own journey. Our Fizzy Labs Innovation Accelerator learning resources are all provided in video format to maximize engagement and reinforce your learning with ease. Plus, our Innovation Accelerator will keep track of your momentum as you complete your journey with us. And hey, if you get interrupted along your Innovation Accelerator journey with us today, no worries. With your permission, we'll email you in a few days with a link which remembers precisely where you left off so you don't miss a beat. Your bigger future begins right now, and the formula for success you need is right here in the Innovation Accelerator. Thank you for joining the Fizzy Labs Innovation Accelerator. We are honored to have you with us. To get started, simply click Launch Lesson 1 to the right of this video. Go, go, go! So remembering the core values that we talked about in the beginning, we wanted to make our site engaging and fun and easy to follow for students to watch like how I solder and they can follow along too. So we have a simple, easy video series with bright colors, engaging, and here I'll copy and paste it right now and put it in the chat. What's key here is that this provides a self-service training experience through the whole thing. Um, but then with the collaborations that we have with the NASA GLOBE program, with the US Army Innovation Labs, and another really important organization, um, every state has one, the New Jersey Manufacturing Extension Program. There are several um, grant relationships that, that we're developing, not just within STEM education, but uh, through the Department of Labor. There are pre-apprenticeship grants, for example, in New Jersey, PACE grants. I don't know if anybody's familiar with those. But the power of, of our, you know, of Fizzy Labs Foundation's approach of infusing innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship into STEM education, it brings these pre-apprenticeship grant resources to help kids unlock the awareness of other career pathways. 
And that's exactly from that very first visit to NASA Goddard about six years ago. That was, that was the spirit of the message that we received together from the chief of strategic partnerships office for, for NASA, which was um, the, the, the desire to see FISI help reach a wider, more diversified group of, of young people. And so a lot of the programs that we run, we make sure that we're reaching out and building collaborations with local universities and getting to inner cities and be able to help secure the resources that are necessary, you know, for the teachers to be able to have all of the material they could possibly have to bring these kids to this new level of, of engaging education. Now, now, again, one of the most magical parts of this um, you know, sort of STEM ed reboot here is the fact that these students, and, and we've, we have kids building the kits from sixth grade up, okay? The students that build it are literally like instantaneously becoming primary data researchers for NASA within GLOBE. The data that they collect and gets inserted into that environment is putting them at a peer-to-peer -peer level, not only with, with researchers at NASA, um, but with many of the universities that we work with. Okay, and so we aim to bring professors, um, you know, graduate, undergraduate students into classroom direct conversations with these students from six through 12, um, you know, so they can already be seeing themselves in the future in these environments and in career pathways um, ahead of that 16 year old 11% creativity warning time. Um, now, I think in, in, in addition to, you know, the, the career pathway focus, um, being able to help the students really be able to find their why is why all the rest of what we do, why we bring the out of this world type approach to the, to the learning is so important. Um, I, I could tell you straight out, I'm, I'm not embarrassed to say it. I absolutely flunked geometry when I was in school. I was rocking 93rd percentile nationally and the guidance counselor told me that I had to stay. Um, and it didn't matter that I didn't understand what was, what was being said. It was a very difficult time. I'm grateful to see that more and more education is opening up to different learning styles. And, you know, I think bringing more of the why out of students, what's in them, what, what they're passionate about, I think is going to make all the difference in the world to being able to go from a world where there's four or five innovators names that everybody can think of to there's just too many to count because, you know, there's that many more that are, that are really trying and, and releasing themselves towards their, their bigger dreams. Yeah, yeah, and well, I just wanted to say when you said you're great in geometry, it made me think. Uh, I'm pretty glad I have an A in honors geometry. So just wanted to share. Pretty proud of that. <laughs> I'm very glad too. I can tell you who's not helping her. <laughs> <laughs> but also, we've been helping. Um, like we work with K through 12. So when students, like high school students, they can develop their sensors and then we bring them to like the younger students who maybe we don't trust using a very hot burning soldering iron yet, but they can still use the data and see. I don't know if you guys can see this. So this is this is a large version of the game pawn in, in launch and out of this world. And, and there's a high school junior collaborating with Fizzy right now out of Edison, uh, New Jersey area. And what he's doing is turning this into, uh, turning the sensor basically into a lamp, all right? So the whole thing lights up, color coded. And then these are gonna be donated from the middle school or high school classrooms that build them. They'll be donated down to elementary school. So the students can have one in the classroom. They can see the color changing in their environment and they can already start having an awareness of the technology, of the science. It can become part of the conversation early. While at the same time, um, we're bringing artificial intelligence lessons to the high school level on this. So you can see that while the core starting point is sixth through eighth grade, um, certainly the build you know, is a great experience for students in high school too, but providing a pathway that gets you from there to what else can we learn within the data? And perhaps what could we maybe predict from the data um, are more really powerful learning experiences that Fizzy feels we shouldn't you know, wait till college or beyond to, to get our hands on that technology when you know, it's all pretty straightforward these days.
as long as you got a mind for it, let's uh, let's provide the education platform to get there. Yeah, that was um, actually like a problem I've noticed. Um, until I became a freshman, I had never used a soldering iron in school or coded before in school unless I took a coding class. And we've been trying to work this into the education system so everyone can learn about coding, soldering, and being more creative. Because from my knowledge, it's helped me through all of my classes. Like in geometry, it's helped me understand how I can apply this later on and like build prototypes and understand measurements. And even like in all of my other subjects, like English, it's helped me be more creative through my writing. So I really want to bring this to more students and have them have like the same experiences that I do. I'm going to throw out their biology too. You got to tell them oh, what yeah. you did there. I did not see <laughs> that coming. Oh yeah, for my biology project, I actually used Arduino, and so first I made all of the organelles in a cell. Um, our project was just to make a model of the cell. So I made the organelles, and then I used Arduino, and I actually used lights, and I put the lights in certain organelles. And then I quoted, coded the Arduino so that it shows like the process of proteins and making RNA, like the RNA synthesis, protein synthesis, and all the different steps. So I got 100 on that project. Pretty proud. <laughs> and it wasn't part of the project at all. And that's how the learning can extend itself, right? When we help students find something that they're interested in and passionate about, they'll find their own ways of how to apply it. Yeah, so... Um, what do you think, Heidi? Should we should we pause for, for questions, comments? Yeah, I think we should. All right. Piz, guys, don't be shy. I know it's been a long, intense day. <laughs> um, well, I was just gonna say quickly, I, I'm I'm an electrical engineering student right now, and I didn't really like get into any like coding or like hardware stuff until I was a freshman in college, and that's something that I like look back at and I'm like, I wish I would have had access to like a kit or something earlier on or like would have been exposed to that earlier on so that I could have I guess like you know identified my interests earlier so I really I really think this is a cool idea I was also going to ask um besides that so you guys have like an educational kit for the air quality which is interesting because it kind of ties together like engineering and education with uh, like real, real world issues do you see any other areas or like issues that students can maybe learn about from this engineering perspective? Yeah, so actually um, one of the scientists we talked to already like began brainstorming ideas for how we can use this to help the environment and measure data. And we've also been expanding this to other monitors, like I said, so you can measure like sulfur or like water levels. So yeah. There's a there's a hydrology sensor. Um, if if you're familiar, I don't know if anybody's familiar, but about a year ago, there were some really serious floods in Germany, um, flash floods, you know, that went through, um, and and there was widespread devastation. Um, you know, having sensors that are out there that can let us know upstream, right, when there's radical changes happening, could at least provide a warning when something like that takes place. So that's just another example. Um, VOCs, you know, volatile organic compounds, being able to have a sensor that's letting us know that there is something in the air, um, you know, could, could, could bring awareness that there's shifting winds and that's gonna potentially move a, a raging fire, right? In a direction that wasn't anticipated. So there's many practical application areas that, that were, um, you know, we're, we're looking at, um, but, you know, always emphasizing to um, the students' interests. You know, our focus is to ask the students, right, where would you like to see this go next? Um, fortunately, the technology, you know, um, around these types of sensors is um, getting better and better, smaller and smaller, cheaper and cheaper, you know, um, so it makes it a lot more accessible, um, you know, going forward. Uh, initial pathway, my Mars mission is, is planning to stay true to its name and, and focus on being able to help craft 
um, you know, right from the from the rover to the to the drone, and you know, provide cool little extension kit ideas that way. Um, but certainly, um, just as ideas, just as thought starters, so that we can see where the students want to go. Chuck, I saw you grab a pretty pretty awesome microphone over there, man. Did you have something you want to share? I just wanted to say that I'm a uh, substitute teacher and I do work in the STEM classroom and I happen to be having a discussion with my son last night about the STEM lesson that we were doing. Um, and the lesson that we were doing was building a bridge out of popsicle sticks and then putting as much weight on it to see how who's, which team's bridge would last the longest. Um, I know, remember they did something like that on Lego Masters. I don't know if anybody watches that show, but they had that on the show. And my son's like, he's 23. So he's, you know, recently out of high school and everything. And he's like, I didn't do anything like that until we were in high school. So it's just amazing that the STEM programs are becoming earlier and earlier and earlier. And in my school, the STEM actually starts a little before sixth grade. I mean, we've had like third and fourth graders and they're working on like, um, it's a CAD type program, but it's like, okay, this is how you make an Easter bunny because Easter's coming up. This is how you draw it in the environment. So I think this is just great that your family is really involved in this and leading the edge of uh, technology and helping the uh, students really break through in their imagination. I really do enjoy the uh, lecture that you're giving. So um, kudos to you, your daughter, your entire family. That is fantastic. Thank you for sharing. That is, it means all the world to us. I mean, that's, that's what completely fuels us. Six years ago, we were on a road trip for a family vacation. We were, we were literally going through the arch at Disney World, right? We were road tripping to go hang out with the mouse. And we got a phone call. And it was from one of our partners. It was New Jersey Manufacturing Extension Program, literally as we're rolling in there. And what they challenged us to, they said, look, um, we have a grant with the New Jersey Department of Education. They want us to figure out how to teach middle school students about manufacturing oriented career pathways because there's all this new cool technology and nobody knows anything about it. And so we spent the week not just going on rides, right? We're trying to figure out how we could make that experience, that education experience, because the first thing we asked about was the makerspace environments in those schools. And we found out that they didn't have the makerspace environments. And we found out that one of them had a 3D printer, but everybody was scared to touch it because they didn't know anything about it. So it was just sitting in a box. And we were trying to figure, or, or, or another school, they just didn't have the space to allocate to it. So we were trying to figure out, is there an answer to all those pieces, right? And it took to the last day of our trip. And all of a sudden we focused on a, uh, a piece of equipment. And we thought, geez, that piece of equipment is really interesting. Um, as a transport vehicle, it was just your average wheelchair. But we didn't look at it as a wheelchair. We put wings on it because the wings could fold up and become the drawing table where the students could design, get their idea out of their head and communicate it with their peers. And then we put a laptop stand on the back so they can go to the Tinkercad 3D type environment and go from their flat pictures to a real, you know, three-dimensional object. Well, that begs the question, can they actually hold that item in their hand, which is why the 3D printer is installed right in the seat. And the reels of, uh, of um, filament were right on the laptop holder too. And oh, by the way, wheelchairs are built um, standard compliant, right, to fit in any, any doorway in a school system. That meant that this could be a mobile makerspace and go from any classroom to another and even be stored in a closet so it didn't get in anybody's way. And it's that kind of imagination. And, and when we ran the first event, it was, Chuck, it was amazing because what, what the kids came up with, Joey and Heidi were like, let's, let's use it as a clock, Let's break the students up into teams, give them materials, you know, like pipe cleaners, paper and clay, and have them reimagine, redefine the fizzy rocket. They have to come up with their own new idea of what that rocket could look like. And the, make, the, the 3D printer mobile makerspace was gonna be the clock. 
but they didn't know what a mobile makerspace was or a 3D printer. We didn't say anything, just started this worrying in the back of the room. And so the first 10 minutes is just frenetic, right? They're trying to get their ideas out. They know they're racing against time, but they don't understand really what that is. And then all of a sudden, a student looks backwards and, and, and notices half of a rocket coming out of thin air, right? Sometimes it's those, it's those indirect learning experiences that just transform you know, every, every step of what those kids experience from that point forward. The struggle of having an idea in one's head and not being able to reproduce it in, in a way that matches that idea um, is an incredible way of reinforcing the benefit of learning the computer-aided design and being able to get the object accurately out of, out of the 3D printer, you know? Um, and so we bring the technologies um, to the table in those moments that the student is wanting to, to learn about those items, you know? Um, and make it a, a way to solve a problem that they actually want to solve. So we deeply appreciate your feedback. It's a, it's a crazy journey that we've been on. Um, and you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna take this as far as we possibly can because there's, there's a lot more kids that deserve these kinds of learning opportunities and um, we're just gonna do everything we can to make it happen. I have a comment as a teacher. Um, I teach high school, I'm a science teacher, and recently in, in New Jersey, and uh, they're starting new computer science and design thinking standards. And for someone who's science educated, but has no clue about computer science and design thinking, when I read these standards, it's like reading Chinese. And, and, you know, they want us to incorporate these standards across grade level, you know, across grade levels, across subject areas. And I look at them and I'm like, Huh? I don't understand how to do these computer science and design thinking standards. Design thinking is is not something. And again, you know, coming out of that, we we've taught engineers to be engineers, <laughs> right? Like we've we've really built that silo and we've done that with science and we've done that with math. The 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 world of design, the world of break all that, don't think about that come up with ideas that, that are breaking boundaries is, is hard to be able to meld into one mind. And that's why our educational approach, Veronica, with, with the, you know, the curriculum that, that we present with My Mars Mission, it's more about helping the kids discover the, you know, the awareness of the other skill sets, collaborate and communicate with their peers because they're bound to find somebody in their, in their class that's interested in something they know they need as part of their project, but maybe they're not excited about it. Maybe they're like me in hardware. <laughs> they don't want anything to do with it. You know, they just want the miracle to occur. Building that sense of awareness and respect for the other skill sets, right, brings a, brings a different power to the collaboration. And so, you know, I, I can tell you one of the things that, that Fizzy really is focusing on is building a, a network of mentors, um, you know, bringing not only professionals like through organizations like the Manufacturing Extension Program, so industry professionals that are available to mentor on the soldering and the, and the um, you know, and the, and the software, but also in the CAD space for that design awareness, right? When the students want to come up with a crazy idea for what that case should look like that they want to print, you might need somebody that, that can help understand structural integrity and, <laughs> you know, and all those things to go along with the cool design and match, you know, and align those things together. So um, I think the, 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 the mentoring aspect is a very important part of what we're focused on bringing as well so that you know, teachers are also surrounded with the right ecosystem of support you know, in, in your community to be able to confidently bring this learning experience you know, to the students, okay? Yeah, I've also seen with the mentors, um, they also inspire, when you find something you like, they suggest ideas of how it can actually be turned into a career. Like if you like, prototyping, it can be design, and all these different factors can actually be applied to more careers than students usually think.
Any other comments or questions? We got a few more minutes. All right, Matt, well, we're going to sign you up to design a couple of these upcoming lessons. It's a, I really appreciate your, your, your feedback, being one of those recent students in particular. You still have a little more creativity than the rest of us. So uh, we'll, uh, we'd certainly like to be able to tap into that, man. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> going once, going twice. Any other comments, questions? We're here to help. All right, well, thank you, seriously. Thank you for inviting us today to participate, for sharing for your, 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 your kind feedback. And, and please don't ever hesitate to ping us. If there's any way that we can be helpful, that's what we do at Fizzy Labs, all right? Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. All right. Go, go, go. <laughs>